A billion years ago, a massive volcano violently erupted in the Lesotho Mountains, bringing to the surface a rare type of magma, rich in gemstones. Over the course of time, diamonds were scattered into the river valley below. This river has never been prospected, until now. A group of top international businessmen, led by entrepreneur and adventurer Peter Jago, have secured this sought-after concession. They must journey to the roof of Africa and set up the world's highest alluvial diamond mining operation with the hope of unearthing the biggest diamonds ever found. Will they succeed in this ultimate high-risk, high-reward adventure, or will they be defeated by the harsh terrain and near-impossible challenges of mining in the mountains? I do believe one thing very, very strongly. If you dream it, do it. I am a risk taker. There's certain traits I fail in. That's why I've got partners. Once the lure of the diamond is in your blood, it's always there. None of us have ever done any mining whatsoever. I'm not the little angel here. I am a little hard ass. My aim is to find diamonds, find diamonds and retire. If you can feel pain, you're still human, you're still alive. I think it's going to be insane, literally, to dig for diamonds. The diamond miners have brought in new machinery to help them attain their big dreams. I'm very bullish for this game. But ongoing labor disputes have slowed progress, and the new hopper has failed to deliver. These are big millionaires that have can't go on the internet and just look at how you do it properly. Investors come and go. I've got a lot of work outside here. Warren and Allen hold down the fort, but tensions between them have reached breaking point. On fucking welding, welding, welding. Frustrated by lack of progress, Warren finds a new site just below the Letzing mine. Up here, they have to employ the old prospecting methods, buckets, shovels, and sieves. But the site isn't yielding any diamonds. I'm gonna hit that one hole. The mine is in chaos, and Peter's dream of finding the big stone is crumbling to dust. I relieved Warren of his duties. I got pulled back down to base camp to keep more of an eye on me or whatever it was. I'm upset about that. The labor dispute has turned into a full-blown strike. No one seems to want to work. Negotiations are rapidly falling apart. We've got two, three weeks left now. If we don't find enough diamonds, we're not coming back next year again. We don't even know who's going to pay us. Peter don't want to say anything to anyone. We don't know if Peter's Well, we have, we have, we are right in the middle of a dispute now with, with Tabo. Tabo, the labor broker, has failed to pay the workers. He wants to pay until it's the end even, of April. Yeah, well, that contract, it's not, it's not even a real contract. He's sending lawyers letters just now. He wants to lock us out of there. That's got nothing to do with whether we're going to work tomorrow or not work tomorrow. Well, All has. that stuff Peter has said to you, and I've heard him tell you before, yeah. don't worry, you will always get paid. Even if we've paid Tabo and he doesn't pay you, we'll lose the money, we'll pay you again. Okay. Thing is, if there's no diamonds at the end of the month, then there's no job at the end of the year. Okay, I'm gonna go and find. Kim sends Peter an urgent summons to return to the valley and resolve the crisis. We arrived last night at about nine o'clock, quite late. Tried to sort out the Tabo issue, which is becoming a big issue, but we will sort it out. Sometimes they, they drive you to the point of insanity, but you just keep going. The solution is to speak to the chief, the entire community is called together for a meeting, or Mbizo. Stephen, the team's Lesotho partner, hopes to address all their concerns. The relationship between the community members, the council, and the guy that we have been using as a labor broker have to totally collapsed. A compromise is finally reached. The miners will deal directly with the community, who will be paid by Peter. They will also employ more people from the village. <laughs> We've just approached the chief this morning and asked him to give us five more guys just to help Alan at the top. Yes, the last time he came down here, he battled to get up. <laughs> he hasn't spent enough time here to get climbed. After a month of prospecting, the top site hasn't yielded one diamond. He's made some significant inroads, but still not at bedrock. I'd love to know how deep that is. Because maybe we're fighting a losing battle here. Yeah. Can't get a pump in the NSV's helicopter, so we're going to send him up five more guys. I think that of all the places, that is probably one of the most likely that we're going to find a large diamond. Everything seems to be running well. I think we just need a bit more effort in terms of volume. We should be doing four, five hundred bags a day. Every 
problem is a solution in disguise. Sometimes that they, they drive you to the point of insanity, but you just keep going. The weather's beautiful. Uh, it's getting a bit colder. The river's full of trout, and um, hopefully our bags are full of diamonds. The dream probably started about 36 years ago, and I thought, one day, I'm going to get up here and find these things. I think a lot of people dream about things, but they never carry it out, and I think that's a shame. I'm pretty chuffed that I, I got my dream into reality. But it's not long before new problems surface. Overnight, there have been two serious accidents. The Rhino, their go-anywhere off-road vehicle, has had a spectacular handbrake failure. Ah, uh -uh, worse. The Rhino did a full-on ramp off this 20, 30-foot cliff, plowed into the ground, tumbled and turned. Fortunately, there was nobody inside there when he went rolling up down the hill. Apparently, Kim burnt the handbrake out. It's what happens when it just starts to nudge forward, and then it'll click knock it into neutral, and then fucking away you go. The vehicle is a complete write-off. Warren has also collapsed. Altitude and fatigue have finally gotten to him. I just sat up top being sick, watching them all retrieve this big machine, and I think I just fainted. Went head first quite a long way down. I uh, woke up, don't know when later, in the middle of this blackness, screamed and called for help like a little girl, and everyone was just super shocked. So was I. I mean, I, I've never experienced anything like that. This time, we weren't that well organized in terms of guys going back home, because they need to. You're locked into these mountains. It was just a bunch of guys. You've got to get out of here. But relieving team members is not an option. It won't be long before the first snow falls. They need to get to bedrock at both sites. We've still got another two meters, because we found a hollow, and we sunk a long steel rod down and we, we didn't get to the bottom. And it's rocks that weigh five, six hundred kilos that we have to move out of the way. So yeah. What have you got for me? The crystal. Go faster, go faster, that's all. Just go faster. We're gonna go back today and come back early next week and then spend a couple of days really helping the guys. I think by then Alan should reach the bottom of the hole at the top. And if he does, and there's no diamonds there, I'll be extremely surprised. This has always been a good hole. Once again, we've never got to bedrock there. You want to find the diamonds, you've got to get to the bedrock and pump. And the more tonnage we do, the more diamonds we'll find. I mean, that's maybe 10 tonnes. I'd like to see 100 tonnes. You know, just more. Come with all jolly, fresh inputs and chip off the go again. Both Rob and I are just a little bit upset that the second pump isn't running. The other pump should be up and working tomorrow. You know, come Saturday, we should have two teams down here working full time as well as a third one up top. Just decide, hey guys, it's, you're running out of time, everyone has to work Saturdays now. It's like... Yeah, I mean, we've got 20, 20 working days left here. If we include the half day Saturdays, we've got 22. With two pumps working, we'll turn that mound of bags into a Lesotho monument. Put some more diamonds in that vault in Missouri shortly, trust me. As the investors leave, bad weather sets in. We got the garnets here. Yeah? They have found 26 diamonds so far, mostly small carrot stones. It won't be enough to cover the cost of the venture. This is all starting to take its toll. I've been feeling it. Uh, these mountains start to get higher and higher and just close you in. The mountain water, always cold, is now almost freezing. And it's fucking hard to just keep pulling yourself back on track. The team is joined by Paul from the Lesotho Mines Department. He is here to certify that the diamonds are in fact from their concession and not bought illegally. There you go. That is three and a half carats mackerel. In the phone bag. Kim. Maybe we should have more shitty weather, we find more sun. A monotonous job this, but it's quite pleasing to actually find something right again. I was actually starting to get a bit despondent there. <laughs> Another one. Whew. This concentrate that we are doing here is giving us good damage. Their luck can change in a second. It only takes one stone. No, pay my wages, I don't know about yours. They are, after all, at the base of one of the richest diamond pipes in the world. During the past six, seven years at Let's Hang, they have found five of the top 20 biggest diamonds in the world. And they continue to find huge diamonds and very special diamonds, blue diamonds, um, pink diamonds, which puts their stones somewhere between two and $3,000 of carat in the rough. 
which is probably close to 10 times the norm. Not so bad, eh? Yeah, there are quite a few glitches in this one. All the stress cracks all around that. I believe that we will find bigger and better stones, and I think we just have to give ourselves the time. But time is a luxury they might not be able to afford. It's late autumn in Lesotho. With the harvest coming in, the snow won't be far behind, and the mine's days are numbered. But Peter's still dreaming of the big one. Let's Egg Mine found a little 12 karat blue diamond. They got seven and a half million dollars for that one stone. So, I mean, it's as simple as that. We just got to find one of those. And suddenly, the viability, we could stay here for 20 years and pump these rivers. And I think that's what we're all hoping for. We're all hoping to find that one that just says, here guys, kick ass. The days are getting shorter, the weather colder, and they still haven't found the game changer. It's getting dry, it's getting bitterly cold. Being out here is tough, but it's, yeah, I'm sure we'll make it through a few more weeks to go. Now Warren's starting to work out how to dry out his suit. Should have thought of that yesterday. Uh, he's not looking happy about putting in a wet suit. But the water is so cold. Extremely cold. This water is like zero, minus one degree. I've chickened out this morning on, uh, on diving. I've got he still flu, still from last week. I was sick in bed. The water's too cold, the gloves are broken, and the suit has got a leak, and it's any and every excuse that you can find in the book. I'm sorry, but I just have no time for the man anymore. No time whatsoever. I don't even want to look at him, let alone have to speak to him. So I've got this, got one of the guys there, he's dived before, so I'm going to chuck the suits on him. I'll put some waders on, and I'm just going to help up with other things. This is a bad influence on the rest of the staff as well. I mean, when these guys all see him with what he's getting paid, refusing to work, then why the hell should they work? You know, so it has a knock-on effect with the whole bloody team. Alan has taken over the top site. We've been struggling up there trying to find something. It's more the not being successful. If one is successful, you, know, you just carry on going, you don't stop. But if you're unsuccessful, if you, if you don't win, um, yeah, it gets to you. I've just given up. I'm sorry, I can't carry on in that hole anymore. So what I've done is I'm splitting the team in half. And just above the hole, we have an island. We've got nice running water next to us. We'll put our strainer in there and we'll use the same system. We're working on bedrock. So there's no escape for anything. Down there, a diamond being heavy, you shovel the sand and the diamond rolls off the spade and it goes down into the hole. You shovel again, it rolls off, it goes into the hole. All you're doing is if there is a diamond down there, you're burying it. Because we cannot get to the bedrock, it's just too deep for us. Any site's a good site, as long as you keep going right down to bedrock. A lot of the sites we've moved before we've got to bedrock, and that's, to me, that's working like a chicken, just scratching the surface and then moving on. Insane. It's starting to get hectically cold now, and now we got here this morning, and all our ponds that we dive in are all iced up completely. I'm not uh, really prepared to get into this. <laughs> um, I don't think Simon is either, so we'll see how it goes. This morning, he led us to believe that he's on his way to work to come and dive, and when we got here, it was just a refuse to dive, and Simon unfortunately has learned from him, so we had the whole staff here with nothing to do this morning. They're dry suits, they're not below freezing suits, oh. you know, no, only if it's got the rig inside and you've got a compressor on your body. See, no one wants to go in, we'll just short time everyone today and all go home. And no one get paid today. Oh, we just let it warm up a bit and we can jump in. Oh, can we jump in? Exactly. Because we're not saying we're not going to jump in completely. That's what those suits are made for. My gloves are leaking. Where are the new gloves? New gloves I don't know. Yesterday. No one told me. No one told me. You must tell Simon when you bring gloves. He'd also like to know that he can have dry hands. With the news that Warren is keeping the best gear for himself, the mood on the site becomes even worse. With no divers in the water, Kim concentrates his efforts on the sorting table. 
There we go. We'll just scoop it off. <laughs> Not worth the paperwork. I would like to have had the big one that this broke off with. No, I've just realized I've got to stop working now. My, my glove's got a hole in it. Doesn't look bad inside. This is a very ugly outside. Uh, it's a case of don't judge a book by its cover. Kim hangs on to this one. Smaller diamonds could have a big impact on the profitability of the mine once the final tally is done. Safely locked away. I've been getting wet for weeks and weeks. Those suits are designed to work into minus six degrees. It doesn't protect you that much. You, you are going to get cold. I mean, it's, it's iced up cold. It's frozen. So, yeah, once it gets a little bit warm, I'll get into water. I think that I can just feel generally the vibe between everybody around us here that, you know, yeah, we've had enough. I think just every day is the challenge. Warren refuses to dive. Simon must get in or the whole day is wasted. Baby steps every day. And just hopefully you get through it at the end. Uh, that's, that's all it is. This alluvial mining is very, very difficult. Mine there, mine there. I think it's too hit and miss. It's not, it's not easy. Ideally, one needs to probably find a pipe or something like it and, and, and start there where you know that you're going to be successful. To start here, 100 meters either side of the river for 13 kilometers, and you've got a pump that could probably suck an area of seven square meters in a week. <laughs> it's almost impossible. <laughs> but yes, we will try, we will carry on. Our deadline is the ninth. I've heard rumblings that we may even go shorter than that. The last thing that one wants to do is to try and get out of here and then the snow comes and you're locked up here for another two weeks before you can get out on these roads again. <laughs> Only mad people would do what we do. <laughs> mad. You have to be mad to come out here in the snow to rescue your men. Last night we said to them, maybe we're going to come this morning and fetch them. If it's raining, they must walk home. Look what's happened. It's snowing. So we're going to go and break everything up and bring it, bring it home. In this, in this weather. I just hope this stuff doesn't turn to us. Okay, Jack. Thank you very much, man. If we had another two months probably, I would have that thing empty. We've broken the back and we've just run out of time. Thirty-five minutes ago it was snowing. Where's the snow gone? Crazy place. It is a crazy place. So let's just pack up and go. I'm, I've had enough of this mining this hole. So yeah, it's the daunting task of packing up. <laughs> Here we have absolute African power bringing our generator up the hill. Well done, guys. Well done. This place is over. Sad to leave it. Maybe we'll come back. Maybe. The mountain is clean like it was when we got there, which is the most important thing for me. Packing up, unfortunately, we haven't achieved our dream. We haven't really got to the bottom of any of these holes into any big pockets of diamonds or anything. Everything there. We ran out of money, we ran out of fuel, diesel, everything. So that's the story. Very sad story. I'm actually missing it already. <laughs> missing my mountain already. It's painful. I really and truly thought that something would come of this trip. I was a strong believer that we would find a decent stone, a good stone, and um, everybody could go away here being happy. I hope we do break even. I'm not that optimistic. Without the big ones, we, we're gonna fall a bit short, I think. With mining at a close, there are still 760 bags to be sorted. Peter will not admit defeat. I'd like to see it continue. I'd like to see us work that whole valley right back to where it dealt us. Because if we can do that, we've then done as much as we can do.
Our license only runs till April 2015, but I know they will give us a renewal. And also we're adding value in the valley. People are employed, they're earning money, they're able to put that money into their community. And then eventually when we do leave, we'll leave that whole mining village as an asset to the community. Let's go. Peter Jago and his team of adventurers have spent the last eight months hunting diamonds in the Lesotho Mountains. It's been a race against the winter snows to find enough stones to pay for the venture. But this year, the snow came early. Now, with the mine closed and all the equipment in storage, the future of the operation hangs in the balance. It's Warren's last day in the mountains. He's finally going home. This whole thing, it's just a journey. And it's, I think this journey's not over. And this beginning of this journey is just, it's been awesome. All the investors are back for one last day to sort through the remaining bags and to say goodbye to the Lesotho Mountains. This morning when we woke up, it was very cold. Water was iced over, but it's turned out a beautiful day. The idea was to close up the mine, get all the machinery out of the mountains, go get it serviced and we knew we had this huge quantum of about 500 bags here, probably about 25 tons. Scratching in the dirt again. Some of us never grow up. I'm going home. That's the end, isn't it? All the banter and chasing around, looking for diamonds and everything has finally come to an end. This has been the best experience I've had for a long, long time. Clean air, good, decent people, good food, and what more could a man want? I dreamt about finding diamonds all night last night. So let's see if any of those dreams come true. This is state-of-the-art equipment. In the absence of an X-ray machine, you have to rely on your eyesight. And yeah, for sure, there's a very good chance you're gonna miss stuff. That's what we're looking for. You find something like that, home and dry. Based on the total find over the whole period and the volume of bags we put through, it will give us a sort of carrot per ton um, hey, return. Hey, hey, hey! What do you I'm not fucking bullshit. That's oh, Mica. No, no. It's not fucking Mica. That's me. It's a diamond. It's it is. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, you see, don't laugh at me, eh? Yeah. You see, we're sorting the smalls. That's where it is. That's from the classic. This is all shit. Yeah. This is all the middle of the mixed mix, mix sizes here. Very, very clean. Great stone. Where are you going to put it? <laughs> There we go. I don't have a bag to put it in anymore. I'll put it in a piece of tape. Yeah, but how are you going to keep it? Where are you going to keep it? In my pocket. In your pocket. <laughs> Can I follow you? Wait for you. <laughs> Paul, you must stay here, eh? Yeah, but you're on the wrong table. You can't go. <laughs> you can't go back to Monsieur. You're going to stay here. Because <laughs> every time Paul's here, he brings luck. We have two mines officials with us. Their function is to prove that we didn't go get them in Sierra Leone, which are blood diamonds, bring them here and try and process them through the system. The idea is to get the export permits now, get the stones out of Lesotho, take them for cutting. Um, hey! This is glass. Hmm? Yeah, that's glass. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is diamond, guys. It looks just like a piece of glass. It's half of a diamond. I'm about to flick it up. It's half. But they said it was all glass. No, that's glass. You can see the difference. Look at the edges. It's stuffed. That's not, that's diamond. Yeah, it is. Very good. Where are you going to put it? Same place. Okay, let's go. Right, let's go. Bring another one. Bring another one. It's monotonous. It's a real monotonous job, but it has to be done. It's two o'clock, the light is still very good, but I'm concerned that because we've got so many piles, bags to go through, that we're gonna, we rush this and we miss something. There's so much stuff, Jesus, we don't seem to be making a dent. We're gonna just stay here until the sun goes down, because we have to. The acid test really is what will the return be versus what we've spent. We are here to do a job, um, and I'm working, but uh, this, this, this prick isn't. Can we have a look at those things we found again earlier? Because I'm getting worried about your ability to retain no, no, stuff. No, you... no, 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 they stay. stay. No, I want, to see, I, want, I want to see them again, please. Anyway, so it's 2 0. So this is what we came here for. We just need to find a whole lot more. Because I don't think that's going to quite do the six bar. You're going to unstick them, then they won't stick again. Then the mm. diamond will fall out, mm. and you'll say your fucking method is no good. Mm. But you've got you more tape though. Up. You've got more tape though, haven't you? I have, yeah. I need wider tape. Here we go. D duct tape. 
We have work to do here. Stop oh, yeah. talking. Yeah. Halfway through the day and look at the pile here. Everybody's working fine until no. you started your... Yeah, well, get it cracking, get cracking. Stop turning around and looking at me. Look at the table. Two grumpy old men are, are getting more grumpy. That's the bottom line. I think they've been in the mountains too long. Peter, you're falling asleep on that table there. Come, there's nothing. I can see nothing on the table from here. I can see there's nothing. The enthusiasm is starting to wane. It's tough to do. You haven't got anything since the moon. It can be bloody depressing because the movie all... Sometimes you get, sometimes you don't. Unlike a mine. <laughs> yeah, this is fucking Dutch, first watch these yeah, things. Like Kim was about to tip this thing up. Came along. <laughs> I bet you there can be something under that pile. <laughs> it's a crystal. No, it's not a you crystal. Had, but you had a fucking tip of table as well. Oh, oh, yeah. Obviously, we can't do this fast because Alan was prepared to tip the table upside down because he said he could stand there and see absolutely nothing. Kim almost tipped the table upside down and then we found a stone. So that thing could have ended up on the ground quite easily. It's in five and six. Yeah, well done, shit, man. You can have a little five carat stone that is magnificent in every respect and it can make an absolute fortune when you cut it and polish it. We found it. <laughs> we got it here. No, it's rubber again. There's a couple of stones that we're very, very excited about. The one is the, the 22 carat and the other is the 13 carat. It's clear they can't sort out all these bags in one day. So they slow down and settle into the rhythm of the mountains. Conrad is the last investor to arrive. Straight away, he gets stuck in. Everybody I've spoken to in the States, they all want a part of the action. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, who wouldn't want to do this? They're not looking for business, they're looking for adventure. Seven hundred and fifty bags. Jesus, eh? that's good. We probably threw away 20 diamonds, but if there were any, they were very small. The last lot here, if there's anything in here, I've already seen it. Yes, we can see the bottom of the pile. Yeah, we'll be gone just now. Sure, I actually can't see anymore. The sun is low in the sky, making it hard to see what's on the table. You know what's the problem? What's the, problem? the sun is gone. <laughs> the sun helps. <laughs> One last stone to close out the last day on the mine. So there's our man, Julius, after uh, 25,000 crystals today. Yeah. Well done, bud. Let me see. I'm glad at the end of the day I got something. I'm really happy. I finally cracked it, how to make that small fortune in diamonds that I've been promised. You start with a very big fortune, and it quickly becomes that small fortune. <laughs> but look how beautiful it is. For Don, the potential of this valley has always been more than just diamonds. This is... As a tourism spot, it's second to none. Seven or 8,000 feet up, this clean air. This is stunning country. It was never about the diamonds. I'm very disappointed that it's over. Um, I've enjoyed it. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed out here in the sticks. It's really been fantastic. It's an experience of a lifetime. Beautiful scenery, sad to be going, sad to be going. Conrad, Peter, and Stephen have come to Lesotho's capital, Masiru, to clear the stones with the mines department and to get an export license. Just put out the vault. We've got um, the diamonds securely hidden uh, in a place nobody would venture. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen's undies. And we're going to classify every single rough diamond in weight and color. And we're going to record it so that that can go to the mines department later on today. On the strength of that, we'll get our export license. 3.88. Uh, you know, it's, it's not even the money. For me, it's the, the fun and games and the intrigue. I love it. We've got all the toys, and we'll have a go. There are four things in a diamond that give it its value. The carat weight, the cut, the clarity, and the color. Obviously, carat weight's very easy. You put on a scale, boom, you've got the carat weight. But when you get to clarity, that's a whole new ball game. Even today, People will debate what that clarity is. Is it a VVS? Is it a VS? Color? They've got a color spectrum, and today everybody has a number of diamonds that are the colors, and they just match it with it. So you just turn the diamond on its side, and you put it next to another one, and you can pick up color. Unusual colors can fetch even more than perfect whites. There's a brown here that I think is going to be pink. Here's a nice yellow diamond. Look at that. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's really pink. 
I'm telling you, I think that's pink. We could get half what we think we've got, we could get double what we think we've got. I'm going to go for what I think it is as a cutter. Where's that second parcel? Oh, here. Yeah. I'm going to walk back to Actress. <laughs> now that's money. <laughs> All along, I I'd wake up in the night and say, Jesus, is this Peter's folly? Have we just blown all this money and stupidity? But then I'd really sit down and say, you know what? That's impossible. Real is what's real. It's real. It's here. 21.71 and a 13.81. I mean, this is the kind of stones every mine wishes for. The wholesale is $227,000, 2.9 million rand, wholesale. If you just go and sell these on auction in a one-off, well, then you'll make a small loss. And that would be stupid because we've said all along that what we want to do is take them to the cut state so we can see it all the way through. We're going to transport it down to Cape Town. We're going to get it to the auctioneers. They will then give us their thoughts on value. As a cutter, I know how much difference there is. It's staggering. I don't want to lose that difference. And I've said that from the word go, that if we want to do this thing properly, we're going to cut it ourselves. Out of the 13, if we get a very good five, and out of 22, we get two good fives. Mm -hmm. They're worth one and a half million each minimum. So there's four and a half million. Okay. Just out of the two big stones. Those two, three big stones could surprise the hell out of us. <laughs> Cape Town was once the home of a thriving diamond industry, but now only a few key players remain. The parcel has been exported, and this is where they will be polished and sold. We should have 12 packets, 33 stones. Yeah. The team at E Diamonds must verify the export documents and appraise the diamonds. 73.87. Correct. They are experts in the diamond trade and will advise Peter on current market values and trends. They will also advise what to polish and what stones should be sold in the rough. The color is not too bad either. When they polish it, they'll try to retain that color. This is the last parcel. Yeah, lot number 12, 10 stones. It looks like it's the leftovers, the cheap stuff. Every stone has its buyer. Every stone has its price. Some people are specifically looking for those. But overall, it's quite nice product. But there's some devastating news about the largest stone. It looks milky. Milky stones usually are fluorescent. <sighs> Look at that. Diamonds are about getting the perfect stone. And that is seen as an imperfection because in natural daylight, there is UV light as well. And if it's blue fluorescent like this one is, uh, it is said that the stone appears wider than it actually is. I think uh, the first thing we need to do is get, get them cleaned. So they're, they're still dirty now and it's difficult to, um, to do a proper valuation on them while uh, the stones are so, still so dirty, so raw. Peter was pretty accurate with his valuations. Some are a bit higher, some are a bit lower. It's actually those two big stones, I think he's a bit expensive. But I would totally expect that from a miner. That when you pull out a big stone, suddenly you get big stone fever. Yeah. Peter, Rob and Kim have arrived in Cape Town to meet with E-Diamond's owner, Anthony, to discuss their options. The rough diamonds have all been washed in acid to remove any stains. Now there's still a little bit of black, but not much, eh? Peter thinks this brown might be a highly valuable pink. If you compare it to any other brown, I think that's going to change its color. For a sampling exercise or low-key mining exercise, there's, there's very good product coming out. To that's find so one stone, yes. greater than five carats, it, is yeah. rare. If you had the right equipment up there, you're going to find the 60, 70, 80s there. Mm. Yeah, it's just going to be there. Peter is not concerned about the fluorescence of the biggest stone. Unbelievable. That is incredible. Once you cut it, who the hell knows, you know? That gives you 100. 100 is rare, so it's an exceptionally rare stone. But for the wrong reason, again, it gives you a blue-white D. Now the question is, what is your guys' thoughts on this? Do we cut it all? Do we cut some? It's not worth cutting all of these stones. Definitely not. It's a lot easier selling rough than it is polished, that's for sure. They hope to cut three five-carat diamonds from the two biggest finds of the expedition. It's going to be very difficult to clean up because you've got glitz all over the place. I think you have to go for the five carat. You can't lose the five, you can't lose the size. But I think it's okay, it's there. You've got enough depth. But the 13-carat stone is full of chletz, feather-like flaws that can cause a stone to shatter during the cutting process. You want to cut it? Take a chance, see what's in the inside. And the big 21 carat stone is the wrong shape. You see two 
five I just see on two either fast. on either side of the one line. either side. Yeah, the shape is good for two five. It's too shallow. Shape is not there for two five carat rounds. I don't know. I, I thought it was. Polishing always comes with risk, but it's possible to get up to 80% more return on cut stones. Stone that documented, that's very, very rare. Mm. To have it documented from when you found it in the river, where right people can see it, that yeah. does add value. Peter decides to cut 20 of the 33 stones. Carlos of Clarity Diamonds will supervise the cutting process. We want to put windows on, have a look what's inside, and then make a decision. If there is something in there, he would like to try and polish it. We've got the best polishing facilities, but it's a natural product. Manufacturing is always a risk. A stone uh, can shatter, small glitz can run, you know, so things do go wrong, you know. Yeah. I'm just going to mark some windows. She's a good-looking baby. It's a little bit fluorescent. Look into that glitz there. I love yellow stones, especially your fancies. This is uh, straight, straightforward. The fancy prices are good at the moment, yeah. eh? And there's a couple of browns in there as well. No, oh, it's just clean inside. Sometimes they can turn pink. <laughs> that's, it, that's exactly what Pete said. He said um, he's, he's experienced with, um, with manufacturing some of these little city browns. We can't ask for any more. For me, it just looks a brown stone. The thing about a diamond is the more you look at it, the more illusion you get. So uh, the more I look at it, it's like turning pink already. You know? <laughs> in the 70s, I joined a diamond cutting factory and I learned to cut diamonds. And that gave me a lot of insight into the diamond industry. But things have changed dramatically since Peter was cutting. I've been cutting diamonds for 40 years. Everything about diamond polishing has changed. I'm a second generation. My dad used to sit on this same bench in the same chair, and now I'm sitting here. The main change is the sarin machine, which maps the polished diamond onto the rough stone. On average, a polished stone loses 60% of its original weight. It's risky, so careful planning is essential. This is a yellow fancy stone. You've got all these shapes that you can choose from to ask the machine to plan for you. In this case, we're going to go for the trillion. It gives you the best recovery. We'll gain a bit of uh, diameter over here. Once the optimal shape is chosen, the plans are given to the cutters. A round stone is more valuable than a fancy cut stone. But the recovery on a fancy is more than on a round stone. We are very happy because of all this color and uh, we're expecting it to be a intense, fancy yellow. The purity is quite good, so pleasantly surprised with this stone. Henny's been working on the brown stone, which was the one that we were wishing could get a bit of a pink tone. Um, unfortunately, the color didn't turn pink. The stone was also very unfortunate because during the manufacturing process, a chlitz ran a little bit, which is quite common when you're working with brown stones. But this stone is really worrying me because if if that chlet shoots any further, it's going to go right through the stone. Then the stone is, um, is going to be worthless. A diamond does have a grain. It's exactly like wood. If you take a log and you put it sideways, it takes a lot of chopping in a V to get through that log. But stand that log upright and hit it with the grain, and it'll split instantly into two. A diamond's identical. You can shatter the stone. So today they use saws, very fine saw blade, on which they put oil and diamond dust, and it slowly makes its way through the stone in the direction you want. The brown stone goes for boiling. Henny starts on one of the white cubes. When you start polishing the stone, you'll put a table on. The next stage is four sides at the bottom, which I normally uh, like to do. This actually turned out to be a nice stone. Looked quite bad in the rough. Now that we started actually working on it, we can actually clean the stone up and end up with a very decent one character and a very nice color as well. Then it would go to bruting. This machine just going to give the stone perfect roundness and a smooth girdle. The next stage is you'll put top corners on and you'll do the same at the bottom, which will give you what we call the achkant. Once this is completed, stone goes through quality control. It will come back and they will then do the brilliant earring. They will split the facets. Is all your facets on? Cutting diamonds is a constant seesawing battle. Size versus purity. What is it now? I think it's a 48 and a half. Oh, OK, that's good. Ali managed to recover a bit more weight. It's always pleasing to add weight because weight um, is money. The stone with the biggest weight is next in line. This is the 21 character. We're preparing the stone. For the more complicated or risky stones, windows are ground onto the sides of the rough diamond to get a better look at the imperfections inside. Once you put windows on it, you have to polish because you can't sell it in the rough anymore. So we're basically almost on the event horizon. No, uh, no turning back. Diamonds are always a gamble. You hope for the best. We are running facets on it. 
Let's just hope for the best. <sighs> this one's not looking good. It's full of glitzes. That's why your polish is worth so much because polishing stones are quite risky. I would have probably had more value selling it in the rough because then you're selling the illusion. Carlos now has the tough task of breaking the news to Peter. Hi, morning, Peter. How are you doing? You won't get a clean stone out there unless it's like a very small stone. Weight-wise, it's there, but you don't want to sit with two five characters. They've got ten glitzes inside. There's an eight character in there that's not going to be a nice stone. So my opinion is to make a smaller stone and try and get it as clean as possible to gain value. Let's hope for the best. Bye. If that stone was a clean stone, it would be worth $300,000, $250,000. But because it's got little marks inside it, it's now worth $40,000. Big difference. <laughs> <laughs> the story of us. It is what it is, as Peter Jago says. It is what it is. Maybe we should have taken the advice of the auctioneers and sold it. At this point in time, we are in a net loss position. <laughs> Which is quite funny, actually, because uh, we all thought we were going to you know, give up work and, and retire for the rest of our lives. Of the 33 stones found in the Lesotho Mountains, Peter was counting on the two biggest to make back most of their margin. Those two, three big stones could surprise the hell out of us. But there's a nasty surprise for the investors. The biggest stone is badly flawed and could shatter if it is cut. After like sleepless nights and a lot of planning, I've decided this is the best way to take the stone. So you lose about 60%. If I can, then we will laser, because then we'll have quite a big piece uh, left. But if it's too risky, I'll rather lose the toppy and save the stone. These have big clits on the bottom. But you see, here's also clits on this side. First of all, try and get a cleaner culet. The challenge will be to find a clean heart or culet in the center of the 21 character. I'm just putting some borax on this clits here, so that it doesn't run further into the stone. If you press it too hard, if the powder gets inside there, that glitz will run further and deeper into the stone. There's quite a big glitz running into the stone, so depending on how deep this goes, the stone's going to get smaller. We're first working on to get to clean the stone up a bit before we go for weight. You can't rush this. Glitzes can run, stone get too hot. This stone is giving me flu. It's all the stress. If we had to leave all the problems inside, it uh, would finish about an eight character. I've got a feeling this stone's going to finish a six and a half. We'll have all those answers um, in the next couple of days. Busy running the table on the 21 character. Still trying to clean it up a bit. But this one's got, still have a lot of work to do. Fortunately, some of the smaller diamonds have been completed with good results. Happy with it. Uh, it's an SI stone. Looks very nice, and uh, I think whoever's gonna buy it will be very happy. One of the gray stones looks like it might be a pink. Are you still seeing that uh, pink shine? Yeah. Let Molten give it a cut on the other side just to, just to get all those holes under control as well so that we get our diameter. You see pink. Right. 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 I think it's a, I think it's a reflection. Any, I think he's been drinking a little uh, too much cough syrup this morning because he's seeing pink in there. I think it's from the brown glitz. That, that would be amazing. Ali is putting the finishing touches on a one carat round. It's one of the most popular cuts on the market. I'm making a mark on my rounders to keep it straight so that I can make everything equal. I'm just seeing if everything is lining up, looks right. Not fantastic yet, but when it's finished, it will be fantastic. The final stage of cutting a diamond is to check it on the Sarin machine for a triple X certification. Triple X is basically your cut being excellent, your symmetry being excellent, as well as your polish being excellent. Your cut is basically to see that all the degrees and all the facets are the same size. Your symmetry is to see that everything lines up, there's no facets kissing or open. What I then do after I look here on this on the Sarin machine, I take it to the microscope to see whether the polish would be perfect. Ali's perfect cut gets a triple X rating. I think it's a very nice stone. It's a SI stone, I think color H about. 
nice and sparkly. He continues to battle impurities, but is almost at the heart of the big one. So I want to draw a line on this snow now. I just want to make it straight. I've got a plan here. The cut diamonds are not as valuable as Peter projected, but this doesn't deter him from laying new plans for the mine. We've now applied for a full alluvial mining license along with a regular mining license, and we've asked them for a 10-year license. We're researching machinery, what, you know, what, what it's going to cost us to set up a, a proper mining plant there. Trying to meet guys that possibly go in as, with a joint venture. Obviously, it would be a new type of, of work we would be doing. Hopefully, be able to employ a lot more of them. Back in Cape Town, the finished diamonds are ready for delivery. It's now time for the big stone to be cut. I finished uh, running the table. I took some of the glitters out that was on the top, but there still remains a lot of glitters in the stone. So I'm going to give it to Molten now. I think after Molten's cut it, it will improve a lot. Start, stop, so we're clear. I'm busy just bringing the cutting wheel forward and then I'm going to cut the stone. It's a 20 carat and we normally work with one carat. This. Being in charge of a diamond while working with it is, is sometimes a bit stressful, especially those nice big ones. You would think a diamond that's very hard is a thing that won't break easily, but a kill it's something that actually is very fragile. Things happen, you know. I made a stone one character, last star, Dalto broke off. It's quite a big stone with big girdles, so there's quite some cutting to do. I have quite sleepless nights, quite stressful, uh, uh, you know, to have to face the, the owner and um, they have to explain to him that something went wrong with his stone. Fortunately, cutting has gone well, and the big diamond has survived intact. This is the girdle that I've been working on. There's the luxury of this EOS machine. It doesn't break out glitzes, and the, the girl is crystal clear. The stone is nearing its end now. A lot better. I'm going to try and make it look even more better. While Ali puts the finishing touches on the big one, there's great news about Henny's Grey. This stone, initially, we thought nothing of it. It's actually got a pink shine to it. We polish thousands and thousands of stones, and it's very seldom that you get a pink result from a brown stone. That's why they're so valuable. Sometimes you get very pleasant surprises like this one. Very happy. I can't wait for the big one to be finished. I just finished uh, the bottom of the stone. I'm busy doing the top now, making the plates smaller. It looks a lot better than it looked yesterday. I'm first getting the maximum weight down that I can. And your stone will finish 7.20. This stone is all about size, not about purity. If you put that in a pendant or something, I think some lady would love it. If you think of where it comes from, from the rough to, to what it is at the end of the day, if you know what a diamond goes through, how hard and how much work goes into it to have it shine as it does, I think you'd understand why it's worth it much. Here we are back in Durban. It's almost a year to the day since we sat in our boardroom and discussed our adventure. Let's see what we've got. Maybe we should have sold the rough. <laughs> but you know, we decided this in the very beginning that we're going to go to the mountains, try and find some diamonds. If we do, we're going to cut them to take it the whole distance. If we'd have taken the biggest stone we found and not cut it, we'd be still saying, well, what the hell would they have got? Listen, it's still a beautiful stone there. Eh? I mean, that is very pretty. Beautiful. And that's a really big stone. The rest have turned out better. There was a pink in there, so that's... Uh, exactly, that's there we go. We succeeded in what we set out to do. We could have ended up finding absolutely nothing. Nothing, yes. 17 carat per 100 ton. That is that's very, very good. good. And not only that, we ball. now have, yeah. coming, a 10-year lease, 24 square kilometre claim with seven fishes on it, coming off one of the world's most valuable pipes. The discovery of diamond-bearing volcanic pipes beneath their claim means they could be sitting on the jackpot. I think we're very lucky. We're in the right place, right time, and hopefully it can go forward from here. The question is, what do you do with it? Whatever it's cost us. I had a ball. Don, who was in a very sad state after his wife's death, is a much happier man. The mountains did that for him. I think royalties and going forward, this claim is worth a couple of million US dollars. So we've, we've actually going to do very well out of it. Been some expensive school fees, but would I change it? No, I wouldn't. Would I do it again? Yes, absolutely. I'll go back in a heartbeat. Eh? First prize for me, I'd like to be mining diamonds. The allure of the diamonds will never go away. The dream is still alive for the diamond hunters. They made a 50% return on their investment, but the adventure has been priceless. <laughs>